Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message today is The Peace of Christ. I will be preaching from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. If you'll turn there in your Bibles, I'll do my best to explain the Scripture this morning and to preach it with passion and preach it with grace. I don't know how many of you here uh, ever heard of the book and which became a movie, Forrest Gump. There was a book written around 1986. Forrest Gump, <clears throat> in this fiction story, uh, was, was a man who stumbled his way into the military and, and, and touched history at several different points. Uh, in this movie from long ago, you may remember the lieutenant, Lieutenant Dan. And Lieutenant Dan was a, a, a crippled man bound to a wheelchair after having his legs amputated because of a war wound in Vietnam. And he was angry, uh, and he yelled at Forrest Gump for saving his life. Lieutenant Dan believed that his destiny was to die a war hero, and Forrest Gump ruined that destiny by saving his life. And then later he struggles in life with that identity crisis and he finds himself struggling with uh, alcohol. And at a New Year's Eve party, L Lieutenant Dan happens to ask Forrest Gump if he had found Jesus. And, and Forrest, being not so bright, says, I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him, sir. <laughs> and at the uh, end of the movie, we, we see, and in the book, Forrest Gump buys a shrimp boat, and then he hires Lieutenant Dan as his first mate, as he promised him that he would do. And after some time together, Lieutenant Dan finally confesses to Forrest, Forrest, I never thanked you for saving my life. And then uh, Forrest says, I think Lieutenant Dan has made peace with God. You see, Lieutenant Dan was lost in more ways than he was found. He thought he had missed his destiny of being a war hero. He was angry that he was still alive. That's an interesting, that's an interesting concept. Angry that he was still alive. But in the end, he was thankful that his life had been saved and, and had joy out there on that shrimp boat. He finally made peace. And I have a question that I want to ask you this morning. Have you made peace with God? There's only one way to make peace with God, and that's on his terms. It's not on our terms. So far in our study of Romans, uh, we've covered humanity's needs for salvation. We are sinners, but we also read about God's plan to make us right with him through faith in Jesus. We talked about this faith. I preached about it. We preached about what it is not. This, this salvation that comes through Christ is not because of our works or because of prior privilege growing up in religious traditions. And we learned about Abraham's example that Abraham had hope even when there seemed to be no hope. When things looked hopeless, he was, he was unwavering and he based his faith on God's promises. In chapter Four closes out with verse 25. He, Jesus, was delivered over death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So I want to review this definition of justification. I'm going to work on it while I'm away in the next few days. I'm going to work on a responsive reading for us. The responsive reading will be about why works does not save us. We are prone to believe that we are doing great things for ourselves and earning uh, extra points with God or toward our salvation or paying for our salvation. So I'm going to work on that responsive reading as something to remind us that it's only through Jesus that we are saved. Justification is how we can stand before God through Jesus. We first stand guilty, don't we? But then God justifies us. And when he justifies us, we are not guilty anymore. 
we are made right with him. We can stand before him face to face. Someone described justification this past week for me in very understandable terms. I had a discussion about justification with somebody. Here's, here's what this person said. It's as if you never sinned. That may be hard for us to wrap our uh, minds around, but it puts a whole new spin on forgiveness, doesn't it? It's not like when someone holds a grudge. And when people hold grudges, they tend to be short with us or maybe even never speak to us again. Or they speak to us, but they're still holding that grudge. You know, they're holding on to it. But justification is treating someone or God treating us as if nothing wrong has ever happened. We are justified. We are treated by God as if we've never sinned because of the blood of Christ. Now in chapter 5, Paul moves to what this justification, this act of God calling us righteous, gives in our relationship to God. We have peace with God through Jesus. And I want to talk about this peace of God this morning. There are two main points to my message today. <clears throat> I had four but I'm only going to make it through two. Here they are. First, peace with God comes at His terms. And second, peace with God comes with substantial benefits. First, peace with God comes at His terms. Folks, I, I believe if you, will, if you will let these two points soak in, it can change your life. Even if you are already a Christian, even if you're a strong Christian and you've been saved since you were six or seven years old, if you will let these two points sink in, it will give you a new perspective, a renewed perspective. Have you made peace with God? Peace comes, peace with God comes at His terms. It's a loaded question, have you made peace with God? Because it is a yes or no question. <clears throat> I am amazed how politicians interviewed on television cannot give a yes or no answer. It's quite incredible. And uh, I was reading about, uh, I, I think it was in Bob Clement's book. I believe, it was, I believe it was his book, I'm not sure, that talked about uh, there was some training that he saw or heard about on how to answer a question without saying yes or no. Well, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's rather uh, interesting when a politician or an official can give a solid yes or a solid no, but uh, for the most part, people don't like to give yes or no answers to things. They're afraid that it might work them into a corner. Have you ever heard someone say, God and I have it worked out? Do you remember the old song, me and Jesus got our own thing going? Do you remember that? Well, it's not, that's not a possible, it's not possible. The statement is not possible because it is not possible to work out a deal with God. God has no deals. God reaching down to sinful people is his gift for us. And the way he reaches down through us is through Jesus. And the way we reach up to God is through Jesus. Now, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 5. And while, right before we read, I want to share this thought with you. Did you know that the world is at war with God? And did you know that sin is at war with God? And in wars of our world, peace happens when the losing country accepts the terms of the winning country of the war. And in our case, we as sinners are at war with God and the only way we can have peace is by accepting God's terms because we will not win a war with God. Verse 1 says, <clears throat> Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. From, from this address... I can get to my home several ways. I normally go in a car, but I can go in other ways as well. I've ridden in other, two other people's cars that I can think of when I needed a ride. One time I, I had my car, uh, I, I, forgot, I forgot how it worked with our family shuffle of cars, but 
I, I walked out into the parking lot to go home and realized I didn't have a car here and everybody was gone. So I called the Uber and took, a, took an Uber home. Now I have yet to ride a bicycle here from my home, but I could if I wanted to and was physically able. Uh, I have not walked the distance from my home to here, but I could if I was able. And there are additional ways that I could get from here to my home if I wanted to pay the price for those ways. But if I were to go to the moon, there is only one way I can get there. And it's on a rocket. I can't walk. I can't take a plane. I can't take a skateboard or my car. There's only one way to get there, and it's on a rocket. I think all of us have accepted that fact. But many people do not accept the fact that there's only one way to God through Jesus. And to get to God, we don't think in terms of vehicles to get us there, but we think in terms of the spiritual. Other religions have their opinions and beliefs on how to get to God. The Buddhists believe meditation and idol worship. Islam teaches the five pillars, pilgrimage, prayer, fasting, giving, and jihad. Hinduism uh, teaches multiple pathways of devotion. Judaism teaches sacrifice and religion. And apart from other, uh, uh, even apart from religious titles or under the guise of the church, people are tempted to reach God apart from Christ just by reading the Bible enough, going to church, or, or finding God through nature or yoga, trying to be kind or nice to people. I talked to a man who was on his deathbed once, and really he was a, he was a relative of one of our church members that was concerned about his soul. They asked me, the family asked me to go see him in the hospital. And when I went in the hospital, here's a man on his deathbed. I'm asking him not to laugh because he was as sincere as he could be with the question that he asked me. In the final moments of his life, he wanted to know if he could fish in heaven. That's what he wanted to know. His life was about fishing. Every spare moment that he could in his life he'd been fishing and in his mind heaven was casting the pole yet once again into the water you know I don't recall what I told him I was grieved that that was his view of heaven and his idea of salvation was just in a boat fishing uh, I think that I don't think any of us are going to think about fishing in heaven. I don't think we're going to think about golf in heaven. What we're going to be doing in heaven is learning more and more about God's grace. And what that looks like, I don't know. But all of us have this desire, even if people say they don't, I don't believe them. All of us have this desire for the spiritual. Students of the Bible will click, quickly learn that the only way to God is through Jesus. There's no other options. And the question I have is this. A couple of questions here. Why won't people accept this truth? Because what has Jesus ever done for us except die for our sins? Think about it. If Jesus had been some type of hateful dictator, I can see why people wouldn't want to accept him as Savior. But what has Jesus ever done? Done to anybody. Even in the scripture, nobody could fault Jesus for anything. All he's ever done for us is died for our sins. Peace must come at God's terms. As we read in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And now in Romans 5, 1, we read that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice that this is only through Jesus Christ, our Lord, which in the Greek, the word here is karios, which is a person exercising absolute ownership rights. In other words, Jesus must have the absolute ownership rights 
to our life. So we have that peace with God comes at God's terms. Have you accepted God's terms? Are you trying to work out a deal with God? I haven't kept up with the president lately, but when he was running for office in the first few months of his administration, he was big on saying that he was the deal maker. Well, I've got news for the president or anybody else that thinks they can make a deal with God, you'll lose because there's no deals with God. It comes at his terms. So, if you hadn't picked up on it yet, here it is. To be at peace with God, you've got to accept his terms. Second, peace with God comes with substantial benefits. I think the word substantial is probably not strong enough, and the word benefits, benefit is not strong enough. But on on human words in English, that's about the strongest we can make it. Read with me. I'm going to read verse 1 again through verse 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. The first benefit that Paul mentions is access. Verse 2 says we have gained access into grace by faith. And the meaning of these two words means coming forward. It's an approach There are two other times this word is used in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 3. As in Romans, each time this word is used, it has to do with an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. So the, the first benefit Paul mentions here is access. Without God extending himself through Jesus, there is no approach. There's no other approach. Jesus made a way for us to uh, approach him. Jesus didn't come on a huge white horse as an unapproachable king. No, he came as a baby like us. Later as a humble man riding a donkey and ultimately he came as the dying, suffering, sacrifice on the cross of Calvary taking the sins of the world on himself paying the price for our sin. We have access to God through Jesus Christ. The second advantage of peace with God, Paul mentions, is our hope of the glory of God. We we not only have access to God in this life, but we have hope in God's glory throughout all eternity. I've been to many funerals, and I'll say that there's a big difference be- between those who grieve, as you've heard me say, with, with the hope, and those who have no hope. Death and suffering are very real, but we have hope because God promises new life beyond death. Yesterday, I, I spoke at a funeral of a friend of mine who passed away, that none of you know. She lived a long, good life. She was a Christian. And at her funeral, there was both tears and laughter. Uh, The laughter came from memories that people shared about her life. And I said, the tears means she was loved. The laughter means she was cherished. And then I read the scripture there that tells us that we grieve, but not as people who have no hope. I heard a preacher one time say something that was one of the dumbest things I've ever heard a preacher say. (laughs) He said, would you still want Jesus as your Savior if there was no heaven, if there was no eternal eternal life? And I thought, well, that's part of the whole package. Right? It's eternal life. It's hope in Christ. The third advantage Paul mentions is this, perspective in our present times. 
Verse 3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. That sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? We glory in our sufferings. The verb here, to glory in our sufferings, is really countercultural. Because what are we supposed to do in our sufferings? We're supposed to lash out. We're supposed to blame other people. We are supposed to take revenge. But how can a person glory in his or her sufferings? We must know that something else greater than our sufferings will be the result. That's why we have hope. We know that something else that makes our uh, something else that's out there that makes our suffering nothing, nothing in comparison. And we know that something that gives us purpose to our suffering. What is that something? Listen to this. There is, a, there is an obvious progression here. The scripture mentions suffering produces perseverance. And this translates as endurance, steadfastness, patience. And challenges in life are unavoidable. But as a believer faces one challenge, they can deal with future challenges. This past week, I talked with a woman who had a tragedy in her family many years ago. And she said, after that tragedy, I've been able to face everything in life because I will never face any greater tragedy that I faced then. Have you ever known this to be true? Have you ever known that a fiery trial was a little more bearable because you already had been through it before and you were prepared and you knew how to handle it? You know, the first time it happens to us, we're shaking. We don't know what to do. We're afraid. The second time it happens to us, we've got it licked or close. And the third or fourth time it happens to us, we already know the pattern. And we know that life will go on after we pass it, right? But how does that happen? It happens because we have the first trial early on. And we have here that perseverance, suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character. It's interesting. It doesn't say that suffering produces character, but perseverance produces character. In verse 4, the Greek word for character originally meant tested or proved. It was used a lot in the marketplaces of the day as coins were either approved or disqualified. We don't think about it today. Every now and then we, we hear about some type of counterfeit. But in that day, coins were approved or disqualified. And in Christ, when we suffer, we can be approved. Just as in the same day, the same word was used as an approved coin. And like a coin, tested to be genuine and heavy enough, Suffering acts as a scale to produce weighty character. I want you to remember that. And then the scripture tells us that character produces hope. It's a full circle as the scripture started with our boasting in the hope of the glory of God, not boasting in our works. And we started with hope. <clears throat> and in the end, all at the end of all of our suffering, we have hope. So if you're going through a challenging time right now, don't give up. Find that hope. Find the hope of Christ that's within you. Persevere. And know that when you come out on the other side, you will have stronger character. Most importantly, Paul writes about the most substantial benefit that a person will get through all of this. Peace. Peace. Peace with God, the final result. This hope does not disappoint. It does not put us to shame. Everything apart from Christ will bring shame. But shame is an emotion that we were not created to feel. It came after the fall. It came after Adam and Eve realized that they were naked and felt ashamed of themselves because they had, they had disobeyed God. Verse 5 tells us, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us, who God has given to us. When you have peace with God, on His terms, you'll experience the love of God 
like you've never experienced it. You will experience it all of this life and you will experience it all of eternity. God promises this and he, he seals this with his Holy Spirit to all who ask. Ask and you will receive. Repent and believe, the scripture tells us. Well, when you read Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and you let it soak in, you wonder why anyone would not want to be a part of this. It is, God is calling you. He does expect us to respond to him. I do believe, contrary to a, a growing wave of popular Christian opinion, I do believe in the free will of man. I do believe that God makes a way, that God has a gift, and that, is, that it is ours for the taking through repentance and belief. Folks, I saw an old track from the 1800s, and the tract was made like a voting ballot from the 1800s, a paper ballot. In fact, I heard we might be going back to paper ballots in the next election because computers are letting us down. But it was a paper ballot, and it said, God has voted for you. Satan has voted for you. Tie vote. You have to break the vote. I'm telling you this morning, Satan does not want you to respond to the tug of God's Spirit. You know, the Bible tells us not to quench the Holy Spirit, so that means that it's possible to quench the Holy Spirit. Satan is tugging at you. He does not want you to respond. But God is reaching down to you. And he wants you to respond. What is God calling you to this morning? Is he calling you to faith and repentance? Is he calling you to something else? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, as we go into our altar call time, I pray that your spirit will be upon us in this sanctuary this morning and that you will reach down out of heaven and touch the heart of the person who has not repented and has not followed Jesus as Lord and Savior. Let that person do that today. Heavenly Father, for those who've already done this, we know that you want us to follow in obedience. We know that you want us to be baptized as a witness and testimony of what you've done in our lives. Father, we also know that you want us to become part of a, a Christian body of, of Christ, a Christian body that lives out this faith and reaches uh, not only our local neighborhood but around the world. We know that you want us to be part of a, a collective unit like that, your church. Lord, we know there are people here today who may be sick and maybe they have health news that they haven't shared with other people and they need healing. This morning, Lord, we, we pray for healing of those around us who need it. Lord, we go into this time asking you to move, Lord, and by faith believing it. In Jesus' name, amen.